Jeremy, are you ready, Jeremy? Jeremy? Are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? Can you hear me? Are you listening? He's not even listening. Wow. I sure just, please remove uh, uh -huh. All right, well, we're going to get started, folks. Uh, we are, uh, we're ready. We're running a little bit behind, but soon had to find your coffee, so. Uh, I'm trying, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for organizing the dinner and, and for those that helped. That was, it was a good dinner. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for letting us be here and for studying your word. And Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. We claim that promise, Lord God, that faith comes through the hearing of your word. And we just pray that you'll grant us faith, that you'll give us wisdom, that you'll fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that you'll help us, Lord God, just to have good fellowship with you and with each other. For we pray it in Jesus' name. So tonight is um, question and answer night, and we're going to do the questioning, and you're going to have the answers, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, we've, we've got some um, questions already, but we'll open it up to you first and see if you guys have any questions that you want to ask. I got one from Kathleen. One from Kathleen. Okay. What is hers? She says, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> she says, uh, how did those demons get in the bottomless pit? How did they? Oh. And uh, why aren't they loose like the rest of them? That's a good question. Okay, we can, we can deal with that. Okay. Well, the question is, uh, how did the demons get in the bottomless pit? And uh, and who put them there? So here's I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Bill, do you want me to take a stab at it first? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So this is you know this is kind of a a hotly contested subject. Uh, even what demons are. All right. So we know we have fallen angels. We know that. From, uh, of course, Satan leading one third of the angels uh, in rebellion against God, and that was before time began. You can read about that in Revelation chapter uh, 12. And so, you know, we read in the Bible about where Jesus cast out demons. And one thing that if you look at demonic activity, it seems like demons have to have a host, some type of a host, whether it be a person or in Jesus' case, he, he uh, banished them to the pigs. And then what did the demons say? What did the demons say before Jesus cast them out into the pigs? Do you remember? Does that don't cast your pearls? No. They asked to go into the herd of the pigs, but what, what was the, the negative statement they made to Jesus? They said, don't cast us into the abyss. Do you remember that? Okay. So what is the abyss? Abuso in the Greek. The abyss is the bottomless pit. The abyss is a place of torment. I believe that there are levels to the abyss. We read in the book of Jude, in Jude chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Uh, there's only one chapter in Jude, so. Uh, <laughs> that, in fact, I'm going to read it to you, okay? Because I don't want to misquote it, but Jude 1, verses 6 and 7, because this has everything to do with the abyss and with demonology, etc. And this is a very, very interesting question. I'm glad that she asked this. Uh, 
Jude says this. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. It says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. That's, Ephi uh, that's uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 6. So what Jude is referring to here, and it has everything to do with demons, and it's, it's, it's a long story, but it's a, it's a fantastic story. And this is not Christianity 101, okay, because there is controversy surrounding this. And in addition to that, you just don't find it preached from the pulpit very often, all right, if at all. So in Genesis chapter th uh, 3, starting around verse 15, I think. Let me just get there. And I'm uh, chapter 3, and it is in... And this is interesting because I, I've been studying this. He says this. So what happened... Or, in Genesis chapter 3, do you remember? Creation. Oh, 3, is that the fall? That's the fall. Oh, yeah. Man. So Satan, as the angel of light, all right, right? Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Remember something about Satan is that he is the great counterfeiter. He's the great masquerader. Everything that God tries to do, everything that Jesus Christ is tries to do and does Satan tries to imitate in an evil way all right he has evil apostles he's got false prophets false teachers he's got false religion false doctrine and I could go on and on but you get the picture of that don't you so after the fall what happened well the Lord God confronted the two sinners and in Genesis 3, 7, it says this. This was after Adam and Eve sinned. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of, of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, this is uh, Adam, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, one thing that uh, I'll bring out that's no extra charge on this, okay? And it's very, um, uh, it's something I want you to think about, is that pre-flood, okay, you with me? Pre-flood, there was not the veil between the supernatural and the natural like there is now. Okay? Adam and Eve walked in the garden with Jesus Christ, with the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, we look at um, the Genesis chapter 6, which we'll get to in a minute, is that the angels, the sons of God, B'nai Elohim, all right, they were the fallen angels. These were a part of Satan's uh, one-third that he drew out of heaven. And one thing I'll say about that, if you think all the fallen angels are united, you're wrong. They're fallen. They argue with each other. They, they have arrogant. They have pride. They want to be the top of the food chain. And we see that mentioned in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 when we talk about the Assyrian which is a different angel than Satan okay which is a whole other study in and of itself so I'm going to try to keep it simple for you okay the question again is how did the demons get into the bottomless pit okay so we see here in Genesis chapter 3 and I'm going to make this I'm going to explain it but not go into the all the details because we'll take this it'll take this whole um, evening it says this and he asked this is God 
Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now the blame game starts here, okay? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. Okay, so it's the woman's fault. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So now it's the serpent to blame. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, now listen to this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, this is a very, very important verse. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You cannot understand the book of Revelation. You cannot understand really the angelic conflict, okay, unless you understand this one verse. This verse is the first prophetic verse in the Bible calling for a savior, right? You're all with me on that? Let's, let's look back at it. I see some, some, uh, some eyes that don't look like they're with me. He says, I will put enmity. En, 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 en I keep wanting to put the M before the N, but it's the M before the M. But you can't say that five times fast. So I will put enmity between you and the woman. Okay? Between, who's he talking to here? He's talking to Satan. Okay? Where is Satan in all this? Well, he's standing right next to Adam and Eve. So that barrier that I just talked to you that, that was before the flood, that wasn't there, is pretty well told of here. And he tells Satan, he says, and I will put enmity. What is enmity? Do you know? Hostility. Huh? Hostility. Hostility. Yes, it is. Hostility. It's, it really is hatred. Hatred. So God says, I will put hatred or hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring. This is Satan he's speaking to and hers. So Satan has offspring, doesn't he? Hmm. Let's, let's, let's look at the next verse here. He says, he will crush your head. Who's he talking about here, do you know? Jesus Christ. Talking about Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And Satan, uh, Satan's head was crushed at where? At the cross. At the cross. That's right. When Jesus said it was finished, it was finished. And he says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So to look at this is this, we could call this the seed war. Okay? S-E-E-D, the seed war. Satan's seed and God's seed. Who is God's seed? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is God's seed, and if Satan is the great imitator, the great masquerader, then who would be Satan's seed? The Antichrist. Absolutely. So do you see how this verse right here is going to tie right into our, our study in Revelation? If you don't understand that there is a war between Satan's seed and between God's seed, then you just don't, you're not going to get the picture. So then we go from there. We go to Genesis chapter 6, okay, which is a very, very hotly contested chapter, all right? So I will tell you what has been the opinion of the church from Christ's day up until around 100 years ago. And I will tell you the opinion, how the opinion changed about 100 years ago, all right? So, it says here, when men began to increase in number on the earth, all right, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, that's the B'nai Elohim, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, 
and they married any of them they chose. Now that seems innocent enough, doesn't it? Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, and his days will be 120 years. Now if it stopped there, it, we wouldn't have the whole story, because the next verse says, the Nephilim, what does the word Nephilim mean? Do you know? What's that? Okay, it's been translated giants, but it means fallen ones. Okay, fallen ones. And in your Bible, it may be translated giants. Okay? So what I'm telling you here is controversial, but true. Whether you believe it or not. All right? It says here, um, the Nephilim. Then who is the Nephilim there? The Nephilim were the offspring of the women, the earthly women, and the sons of God. So who were the sons of God? That's, see, that's, that's the whole key to the whole thing. Now, uh, from 100 years up to now, the doctrine has changed to say, well, the sons of God are the sons of Seth. They're the good line. Okay? And the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain. And when they married, which they shouldn't have, because this, they, the men were good and the, and the women were bad, so, I mean, it doesn't even make sense, first of all, because number one, were all the sons of Seth good? No. Probably not. Were all the daughters of Cain bad? No. I hope not, right? But the B'nai Elohim, okay, and we have that word Elohim used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, when God said, let us, Okay, let us create in, uh, I don't want to lose my thought here, now hold on. Oh, in Job, when Satan came before the Lord, right? Remember that in chapter 1? And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Satan and those that came with him were called the B'nai Elohim, B E N E with a little slash over the E, Elohim. So these were fallen angels. Okay, these were fallen angels at this point. And again, uh, it's, it's controversial. Some people believe that they were the sons of Seth. But if you follow that doctrine all the way, it just doesn't make sense. And it does make sense if you believe that they're the sons of God. And you think, well, how could angels have sex with humans? I don't know. Go to the story of Sodom. Men in Sodom sure wanted to have sex with those boys, didn't they? And they were angels. And look at when the angels visited Abraham. What did Abraham do? He washed their feet. Okay? So angels can take on the appearance of humanity. What we don't understand about angels, okay, is this. Angels have a society. They were created before mankind was created. All right? And in heaven, they have infrastructure. They have, I mean, they're not just all floating around in the air somewhere, hoping that the Lord will give them some command to do something. No, they have infrastructure. We see in Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, we see that there are principalities, there are powers, there are evil in high places, there are general demons. Colonel demons, lieutenant colonel demons, captain demons, sergeant demons, and then you have your run-of-the-mill private demons, right? Okay, or fallen angels. I should say fallen angels. And the Bible tells us that we have to stand up against them. Right now, the veil between the supernatural and the natural has been closed for most people. Sometimes God will let one cross over to the other. Let me give you an example. Do you remember when Elijah, I believe it was Elijah, and he was, he was they, were, they were running after him, and, and there was all the chariots on the hills, and Elijah's servant came up to him and said, dude, we're cooked. 
Why don't you use said do, but you know, <laughs> might not say do, okay? He says, look at it, look at the chariots. We're, we're, we're done for. And what did Elijah say? What did Elijah see? He saw the thousands of angelic angels on the hilltops and said, take a look. And God allowed his servant to see the supernatural. Okay. Now, look back at, um, let me think about this. I'm trying to where I'm going here. Um, Elijah, or something else I wanted to, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. So, we have the sons of God, which are the fallen angels, and they are mating with human women. Now, that may seem very, very strange, but there are stranger supernatural things that have happened. Now, they had this race of people called the Nephilim, which basically were half human, half angel. Now, can a half human and half angel go to heaven? Yeah. Do they have a soul? See, that's, that's the thing, is do they have a soul? Now, let me, let me put this out to you. Boy, I'm really worried, you aren't, worried you aren't I? Okay, okay, good. All right, so think about this now. Satan, your seed is going to hate God's seed. And he's going to crush your head. So Satan is thinking, oh, I don't want my head crushed, right? So Satan is going to do everything in his power to try to thwart that seed of God from being born. We see it, first of all, in Genesis chapter, well, we see it, first of all, in the line of Seth. Cain killed his brother Seth. Seth was the line, or Abel, I'm sorry, Abel. He killed his brother Abel. The line of the seed of God was going to come through his brother Abel. And Cain, being an unbeliever and willing to bring a sacrifice, wanting to bring his own works before God to satisfy God, killed his brother. So that was Satan's first attempt to kill the seed. His second attempt was this chapter 6, uh, the angels, because why did God flood the world? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let me tell you, okay? Are you finding this interesting or not? Yes. Okay. So here is the account of Noah. I'm in Genesis chapter 6, verse um, 10. Okay? No, I'm in verse 8. It says, but the Noah... Well, you know what? I'm going to go back a little bit further than that. Hold on. So let's go back to Genesis 6, 5. Okay? Genesis 6, 5. Remember, the question is, how did the demons get into the bottomless pit? Or the abusos. And I'll get to that in a minute. It's a long story. But it's a good story. It says here in verse 5, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of, of the hearts, of the thoughts of his heart, was only evil all the time. Now well, that's bad. I mean, think about that. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, every not just every minus one, but every. It was only evil all the time. Not just part time, but all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, what had happened in this antediluvian period is that this genome, okay, from the fallen angels and their mating with human women had spread through the population, almost all the population of the earth. And I'll get to that in just a second. Bestiality was common. You know what bestiality is. Okay. Homosexuality. All kinds of perversions were common. 
and the fallen angels were responsible for that. Have you guys ever watched um, the shows where they show the, um, the huge giant stones that are in Peru and, and all over and they, they marvel because they're, you can't even put a credit card in between the, the cuts, they're so precise. And they wonder, well, how were these made? I'll tell you how they were made. They were made by the Nephilim. They were made by that society that was pre-flood on the face of the earth. That's how they were made. They were giants. And there have, there's been quite the cover-up by the Smithsonian because giant bones have been found and they have said, well, we need to put those in our uh, museum or whatever they call it, and then they disappear. The giant mounds or the burial places of these giants have been found all over the world. Sardinia, Sardinia is a big, a big uh, uh, place for them. Malta, the island of Malta, they found them in the United States. Right. There was giants where Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. They had, there were there were these Nephilim all over the world. Why do you think that there were pyramids or ziggurats? in almost every ancient society. Not just the Egyptians, but the Aztecs, the Peruvians, Machu Picchu, I mean all over. Now, so what happened is that the genome of human beings became so corrupted that, verse 9a, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt. This word corrupt in the Hebrew means physically corrupted. They were physically corrupted. God saw, saw how physically corrupted the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. The entire population of the earth was physically corrupted. Now, let me ask you this. Could Jesus Christ have been born half angel and half human? Would he have been able to be the savior of the world? That was Satan's plan. That was Satan's plan. We're going to corrupt all flesh and we're going to try to thwart this seed of God from crushing my head. Are you with me? Okay. And I'm telling you, it, it, what I'm telling you is not Christianity 101. This is very controversial and... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the Holy Spirit leading us. Now, now listen to what it says here. So, it says in verse 13, God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, etc., etc., etc. Now, when it says Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, what the Bible is saying there is that he was not corrupted by this angelic genome, okay? He was, out of all, this is hard to imagine, but out of all the population of the earth, there was eight people that God saved through the flood. Eight people. It doesn't say that Noah's wife was not corrupted, it doesn't say that his sons were not corrupted. I think they were, or I think that they were not corrupted. But the three wives, or the two wives, you know, three sons, three wives, they could have very easily had that angelic blood in them, which we see the Nephilim arising after the flood. So now I'm going to bring you to the answer to the question, okay? So the flood was for how many days? 40 days. That's right. And uh, it, it rained from heaven, and the springs opened up from the deep, and the whole earth was flooded to the top of all the mountains. Don't buy this, uh, don't buy this story that, 
oh, well, it was just a localized flood. No, it wasn't a localized flood. It was, it was the earth. God flooded the earth. Why? To get rid of that corrupted flesh. Noah and seven others were saved through the flood. Now then, what happened to the Nephilim? They had nowhere to go. Hmm? They had nowhere to go. When God pulled the drain plug after the flood and <laughs> everything went down, okay. they went down to the abyss. That's where they went. Demons, it is said, are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. That's why they need to have a host. Demonic activity has to have some host. False angels don't, uh, fallen angels don't have to have a host. They're just, they, they have their own bodies. But demons are bodies until they find a host. That's why we call it demon possession. Okay? So to answer the question, how did the demons, which were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, which were the progeny of the fallen angels and human women, okay, half angel, half man. They, when God pulled the plug, they went down. Now, I'm going to give you something that's very interesting, okay? Very, very interesting. How long did it take for the waters to recede? Oh, you're close. 150 days. In Revelation chapter 9, when Satan is given the key to the bottomless pit, the abyss, and he opens it up, what do we see? Do you remember from Revelation chapter 9? Do you remember the locusts? The locusts came out of the bottomless pit like smoke. These are going to be these demons that have been held in judgment according to Jude until the time of judgment. And you know what they're going to do? It says in uh, Revelation chapter 9. They're going to torment men for 150 days. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, they're kind of, God is using these demons to get back at people that don't believe during the tribulation. Because if things keep going the way they are, do you all know what transhumanism is? I'll tell you what transhumanism Sorry. is, okay? Um, transhumanism is the, um, I'm trying to think of what the word uh, is. Um, it's not synchronization, but it's a word that begins with S. Of human and machine or human and animal, okay? Our military right now is being tested with animal genomes to try to make their vision better, to make them faster, to make them so they don't have to eat all the time. They can go a long, a long time without eating. They can... Uh, have the vision of an eagle, speed of a cheetah. Uh, this is true. Just go Google it. You'll find it somewhere. So, the transhumanism could bring us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the come of, coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, people were a chimera between angel and human with the exception of Noah and his family. When we get to the mark of the beast that will be something of a chimera of transhumanism between a machine and a human or something and when they take the mark of the beast they cannot be saved. There's no repentance at that point in time. So you don't want to take the mark of the beast. Of course, we're not going to be here, which is really good news, okay? So, that is the short story of the long story of the angelic conflict. So, you go back 
and you, we, we just, I just want to touch on the seed thing again, okay? Your seed is going to hate God's seed, he says to Satan. Now you look back at what happened. How, if, if, if I ask you the question, how do you know, how can you refer back to how did Satan try to thwart the seed of God from becoming human? By corrupting it. By corrupting it, okay, absolutely. Any, any other thing? How about when he had the babies killed, the male babies? Yeah. That was, a, that was a, 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 an attempt to try to stop the seed from ever becoming the Christ, the Messiah. And when we see Satan at the midpoint of the tribulation enter into the body of the Antichrist, just like Satan entered into Judas before Judas gave up Jesus Christ, right? Remember that? Okay. Same thing's going to happen with the Antichrist. He is the son of perdition. Judas was called the son of perdition. All right. And um, so the Antichrist probably will be a chimera, part fallen angel and part human. So he's probably, if we're, if we're not wrong, he's probably alive somewhere in the world today. And it says in Revelation chapter 13, it says he will suffer a fatal wound. And when you look in the Greek at that word fatal, it's the same word that was used for Jesus Christ dying. So he's going to die. It's not going to be a fake death. He's going to die. And Satan is going to be given the power to resurrect this guy. And when he's resurrected, Satan is going to enter him and have full control of this person. And it says in Revelation chapter, well, it says in Revelation chapters, a couple of different chapters, that men will not repent. They will refuse to worship God and they will worship the beast. They will worship the Antichrist. Now, we see, now we see the foundations laid for this right now in front of our eyes. And the foundations that are being laid for this are the globalist movement, okay? That's, that's one big deal. Um, another thing that's being laid for it is the, say that? The money. The money, exactly, yes. The money going into this uh, cashless society, which is going to be required of everyone at some point in time, probably before the Antichrist shows up on the scene. They are, t right now in China, they're testing it. In Sweden, they're testing it, right now. And in the United States, it's in discussions. President Biden, let me just say Mr. Biden, okay? Mr. Biden wants to, wants to implement this. And the World Economic Forum, Forum, the WHO, World Health Organization, all these particular world organizations are all planning on having all this implemented by 2030. Yeah, Fauci's evil. Even Fauci. Little, little Fauci. He's evil, man. He's very evil. Okay, Bill. Uh, I would add one thing to it. The uh, Nephilim, if you look in the Greek, under... Um, Nephilios. It means the temperate or the sober. So you could almost think of the giants as the sober minded. Like as though people, these are uh, people who had spent their lives worried about or concerning themselves with ruling others. And that is what it says. Think about this. <clears throat> Look, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, they were sober minded in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they were uh, bore children unto them, or to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, 
men of renown. So it's almost like you could read this as these are people, they're basically the beginning of rulers. Um, as we understand great empire leaders, I'm trying to think of the um, Sargon, the first great, or the first uh, emperor ruler. Yeah, he was very powerful. So you can see that that is yet another way of looking at this. It's, it's the beginning of that kind of rule. Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll add to the addition is it says here in Genesis 6, 4, it says the Nephilim, all right, work, thank you. Um, the Nephilim were on the face of the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. Now listen to this next sentence. They, speaking of the children, were the heroes of old, men of renown. Can you name any names? Thor. Thor. Hercules. Hercules. Who else? Atlas. Well, if we're talking about real people, we, we could be talking maybe about Sargon or possibly uh, uh, Hammurabi. And people of that sort. Yeah, and these, these were supposedly mythological people, okay? But the point is, is that these were very powerful people, okay? And uh, it's just, I love the mysteries of the Bible. It's just amazing. So, yeah. all right, let's get to question number two. <laughs> wow. Sorry about that, Bill. That's good. <laughs> Who's got another question? And it, it can pertain to that or it can pertain to anything. Yes, John. Any idea of where the abyss is? Where the abyss is? You want to tackle that one? Uh, well, some have said it is in the heart of the earth, but uh, let's see what, if the Bible actually tells us where it is. Okay. Uh, it says in Revelation 9 that the angel was given the key to the abyss. What did Jesus Christ say in Revelation chapter 1? I have the keys of death and Hades. So who gave Satan the key to this bottomless pit? Undoubtedly it was Jesus or a representation of Jesus. So tell me when you come up with something, okay? Okay. My tendency is to think of uh, Tigris and Euphrates. Is that what was Tigris and Euphrates? Uh, that could be an interesting uh, location. So he opened up the shaft to the abyss. So when we think about a shaft, what do we think about? We think about something that probably goes down into the earth. Could it be in the sea? In the you know the deepest part of the ocean is deeper than Mount Everest is high. So the deepest part of the ocean is higher than the highest point on Earth. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, the Mariana Trench is, is the deepest in the, in the ocean. It's, uh, it's, I believe it's around 30,000 feet deep, which is total darkness. Isn't that an area that is like there is a deep trench near the Philippines. I don't know if that's the Mariana Trench. I, I want to think the Mariana Trench. 36,000 feet deep. 36,000 feet deep. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. All right. Starting with verse 12. Okay. Now this is, of course, obviously just pure speculation. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's, that is very mysterious. These spirits that are kept 
in the Euphrates or under the Euphrates are going to be let loose um, somewhere. Let's see if I have that written down. But the three evil spirits that look like frogs. Okay, that's weird. They came out of the mouth of the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. And out of the mouth of the beast. Who's the beast? Antichrist. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, they are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle, battle on the great day of God Almighty. So, yeah, where, I mean, where are these three frogs hidden in the Euphrates? And did you know, by the way, that the Euphrates River is drying up? Mm -hmm. Isn't there somewhere in Revelation that says when that dries up, and the Chinese, I believe it is. It says the kings of the east, numbering 200 million, will cross over. You see, the Euphrates River was the dividing point between um, the far east, okay, and then the east. And uh, if you look at the Euphrates River, it starts in the mountains of Turkey, and then it flows down, and it goes through three or four other nations before it enters into the Persian Gulf, all right? So where is, question is, where is the shaft, or where is the abyss? Well, the Bible really doesn't give us a specific location, but it's got to be in the heart of the earth. I mean, it's, it's just got to be in the heart of the earth. And uh, we know this about the abyss, is that there is a place in the abyss that's called Tartarus, okay? Tartarus is like the lowest of the low. That's where these demons are kept until the day of judgment, where these uh, uh, demons of the Nephilim are kept. And when he opens up the shaft, these horrific looking demons, oh, I'm glad you asked what they look like, let me tell you, Revelation chapter 9 tells us, it says this, it says, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. Stars in the Bible almost always refer to angels of some type, at least in the Old Testament for sure. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened it, so this star is a he, opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree. That's exactly the opposite of, what's, of what um, a locusts do, okay? It says here, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. <clears throat> they were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months, 150 days. Remember, the Jewish calendar doesn't have, it's not the same as ours. They have 30 days in a month, period. And then they, their months, their calendar doesn't coincide with our calendar. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Now it says here, and this is amazing. During those days, men will seek death. They're not going to seek the Lord. They're going to seek death. But they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Now listen to this description of the locust, because it's, it's weird. Think of these as being demonic beings, okay? The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Now you notice he uses resembled, he uses looked like, that's the best he could do. 
Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like a lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. So this will be, uh, and Apoll uh, Apollyon was worshipped as a god, a false god. Okay, so this false god is going to be coming out of the shaft with all of these terrible looking locusts and they're going to torment men who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads for 150 days. I should also ask that, that uh, the Euphrates symbolically is the end or the absolute limit of the kingdom. If you get that in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 24 every place whereon the soles of your feet uh, shall tread shall be yours this is talking to the children of Israel um, from the wilderness and Lebanon from the river Euphrates even unto the uttermost sea shall um, shall be shall your coast be uh, there shall no man be able to stand before you for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon as he saith, hath said unto you. So what what scripture is that again? Bill? This is in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. 24 25, okay. Yeah, yeah so maps of that, so where you can see how the kingdom uh, at its greatest extent actually stretched to the Euphrates. So then these three demons are right at the edge of the land that was promised to Israel. Right? Yeah, whether you want to think of it as literal or physical, that's the limit. Yeah. So the question is, is where is the uh, opening of the abyss? Um, my guess would then have to be the burning of Euphrates, right outside and that, symbolically the kingdom of And that could be a real good guess, yeah. I was looking on the map Speak, and speak louder. I was looking at Google Maps, and the Euphrates is right, the heart of it is ancient Babylon and the Ishtar Gate. Huh. And that's in Iran. Yeah. So, I didn't, that didn't really click until you guys started talking. And where was the genesis of most all false doctrine? Babylon. Yeah. It came from... The, the land of Shinar, the plain of Shinar. Again, it, it is uh, used symbolically throughout the Bible. Babylon stands for confusion. Yeah. Okay. Good question, John. Yes. And I was just looking at Euphrates in my phone, and it said it's drying up, and they said that that was a sign of rapture. The rapture was coming. See, nobody ever believes me. Is this the Tower of it's like right below where the Ishtar Gate was located. Yeah. In that same area. So they, they love that area. Mm -hmm. is, is this interesting or what? Yes. Yeah. I think it's absolutely fan, a fascinating to me. It now, is. go ahead. I was going to uh, the whole study of the Tigris for Euphrates River Valley. Uh, we think of it as desert. It was not. In antiquity, it was beautiful, it was lush, it was green. It was the Green Valley. Well, and if you look in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it talks about the Garden of Eden being fed by four rivers, two of which were the Euphrates and the Tigris, and the Pishon and the Gihon, which they're not sure where the Pishon and the Gihon are, but if you look at uh, maps, if you look at photos that were taken from space, you can see that there are several dried up riverbeds, big riverbeds, mm -hmm. that kind of almost, I'm not going to say they parallel the Euphrates and Tigris, but they meet up there at the uh, uh, Persian Gulf. Okay? Good job. Yes, Jeff? When I uh, 
think about these three uh, demons that look like frogs, I think of the normal portrayal of aliens. They're little, they're little green men with big heads, whatever. Big eyes. Big eyes. Um, I can see how that would really play in. I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, you know, have you guys noticed that alien phenomena is really big now on TV, in the news, the government is, is letting out studies and letting out things and, and pictures and all kinds of stuff about, they call them UAF now, UAF, Unif Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, used to be UFO. But see, UFO has such a, you know, uh, uh, reputation, you know, oh, your conspiracy theory, theory and all this stuff. And then you've got the show on television, Ancient, Ancient Aliens. Have any of you ever seen that? Yes. Yeah. And what they say are, is very interesting, except what they don't know is they're describing fallen angels. Yeah instead of ancient astronauts. Well, the guy that wrote Chariots of the Gods mm -hmm. yep. is actually a believer. Oh, wow. And I was watching a biography on him, and he's the one that has influenced the UFO community. <coughs> but he still believes, as you believe, that these are the fallen angels. Um, but the UFO community has kind of taken what he started and kind of... Yeah, I forget what his name is. Um, yeah, it's... It's a, he's, a, he's a German, I think. Oh, yeah, right. Or European, yeah. yeah. Chariots of the Gods, though, was the book. Yeah. That was kind of, one of, the, one of the original UFO he's uh, Catholic. books. I kind of okay. tend to get him confused with Thor Heyerdahl, but he, that was No, no. Um, mm -hmm. but his name is on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see, you got five minutes. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. There has been more sightings oh. of those UFOs mm -hmm. during more chaos in the world. Yeah, well, well, in the and it, I'm trying to think what the name of the god was. Of course, it was a, a god with a little G, but he was the god of chaos. And this god of chaos is a fallen angel, and that causes chaos. Probably, yeah. I mean, think about these Satan and the fallen angels. What did Satan say? And, and we'll finish with this unless Bill's got something else he wants to bring up. But in Isaiah chapter 14, here's what it says. This is a uh, what they call a um, esoteric passage. Big word, huh? Esoteric passage. It's addressed to the king of Babylon, but it's like a dual prophecy. It's really talking about Satan. Here's what it says. So he addresses the king of Babylon, but he's really talking about Satan. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. Now we know in Luke 10, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, huh? Satan's been cast out of heaven a few times. And he's going to be in the tribulation. Uh, he's going to be cast out of heaven for good. And that's what it says, that because he's cast out of heaven, he is really mad. And he knows his time is short. Well, so it says here, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. This is very interesting. This is the five wills of five I wills of Satan. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. So he's cast down, right? But he says, I'm going back. He says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. What did I tell you the stars of God stand for? Angels. I am going to rule angels. 
And, 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 and he thinks he has a throne. I will sit enthroned on the amount, on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. Where is the sacred mountain? The temple stands on it, the, the remains of the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah. The, 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 the temple mount is the sacred mountain. It's Mount Moriah, which is where Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, etc. So Satan says this, I will sit enthroned. I'm going to have a throne on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. Who's supposed to be sitting on that throne? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus. Yeah. He says, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. The atmosphere. I'm going to rule the earth. I'm going to rule angels. I'm going to sit enthroned on Mount Moriah. All counterfeit of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to rule main angels. In fact, he's not finished. He says this. I will make myself like the Most High. I like the way the King James says it. I'm going to be God. So he says, I'm going to be God. That's been Satan's goal all along. When he, did you know, and, and we'll study this probably when we do Revelation on uh, Sunday. Did you know, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 28. This is another esoteric passage. He, uh, Ezekiel is... Uh, God has addressed the king of Tyre, but it's actually addressed... It's actually talking about Satan. In Ezekiel chapter 28, I'm, I'm, and I've got a reason for telling you this because it's, it's pretty cool. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I mean, Ezekiel 28, at verse... 12. Okay? Ezekiel 28, verse 12. You were the model of perfection. He's speaking to, to Lucifer right now. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Now this is the Eden. This is a different... I believe that this is an Eden that's in the heavenly realms. The garden of God. Now listen to this. Every precious stone stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones, you were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created. Now, you know those stones he just mentioned? If you look at the priest, the high priest's ephod, the exact same stones. I will throw one more point into this. Uh, when you look at that, and you look at the Nephilim being um, the, the silver-minded, that is, the rulers, the giants, they are demons. Both of these kings, both of these prophecies are literally addressed to kings. One to the king of Babylon and one to the king of Tyre. Yeah. Yeah. There are kings of the earth and there are kings of the supernatural. Giants. Realm. So speak. Yeah. So he says, he said to Lucifer, which was Satan's name before he fell, he says, you are the model of perfection. He was probably either the highest created angel or one of three or four or five highest created angels. And here's what it says in the next verse. It says, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Satan looked at himself in a mirror and he said, Man, I'm a good looking dude. I'll tell you, I should be God. Look at these stones, man. Look at my power. I should be God. In fact, you know what? I think I'm going to usurp 
God's throne. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what he's been trying to do ever since he fell in prehistory days. Okay? And so this is the battle that we see when we see the battle is the Lord's. Okay? When we see him telling Joshua, go into the land of Canaan and completely destroy all of the uh, uh, peoples that live there because they were giants. They were corrupted. There's lots of stuff we got to learn, isn't there? Isn't that all like Adam and Eve? They wanted more power too. Yeah, I mean, and Satan talked them into it. Yeah. And Satan wanted to destroy God's creation. And he's still in the business of destroying God's creation. Yeah. Isn't that just... And you know what's the sad part about it? Is that salvation has been paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the promised seed in Genesis 3, 15. And people reject it. Here's a free gift. You don't have to work for it. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's been paid for. All you need, need to do is sign on the bottom, on the, on the dotted line, and people say, nah, I'd rather live in my sin. That's pretty sad. That's right, right there in the, the story of the uh, uh, the guy who died that went to hell. What is it? Lazarus? For if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It's Luke 16, 11. Yeah. Yes, Sue? Well, I'm curious now, and maybe this is a... You're always curious. I'm but, so, we're going to get a new heaven. God's going to down a new heaven and a new earth after the millennium. Right? Yes. So if the abyss is in the old heaven and earth, then that won't come down. No. The old heaven and, and earth will pass away. Yeah. 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 So the abyss will pass away. Also the mount the will has come out. With the Say that again, John. The mount Well, and remember this, okay, in Revelation chapter 19 or 20, is that what happens to Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist? They get put into where? The lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, it says. So the lake of fire could very well be somewhere else. But there, we're, we're, I don't know if we'll be privy to that or not. I think we might be. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind being there. You know, a little popcorn and black Pepsi and, you know. I always think of that stuff like a black hole. Black hole. You can't see in it, but things are going in there and they're not coming out. Yeah, it's very sad. But yeah, I mean... Will the abyss go on forever, or will the abyss become the lake of fire? I don't know, but yeah, yeah. In any event, after the millennium at the great white throne judgment, all of evil is going to be wiped off everywhere, and it's just going to be God and His and Jesus Christ and the body of Christ, and then the Old Testament believers, the tribulation believers, etc. So. Yeah. Well, it's going to go into outer darkness. Yeah. It just looks to me like we're rushing toward the culmination of all of this. Uh, the, the statement was we're rushing toward the culmination of this. Um, yeah. It would certainly seem that way, wouldn't it? Like you know, uh, I mean, we could talk for another hour easily on, the, on all this stuff, but I will just say this, okay? And then we're going to pray. Um, if you look at all the signs, okay, 
and you take them individually, many of the signs have been going on ever since the beginning of time. Earthquakes and whatever. But if you look at what's happening now, it's the convergence of all the signs. All the signs are coming together now, and it, they are, they're forming this prelude, or the beginning of the birth pains, as it says in the Bible, uh, for the Antichrist to be introduced on the scene and for Satan to, uh, to do his thing, as we're going to read in Revelation, and for God to do. Remember, remember, what is Revelation about? Revelation is about the revealing of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. This time it will be as King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not as the suffering servant. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us with your word. And, and Lord, we know that these things are very mysterious to us and to most people, but we know that your word is true and that your Holy Spirit is true. And we know that you will always guide us into truth as long as we follow your word and follow your Holy Spirit. And we'll praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, th I think we should charge for this one, don't you, John? I mean, this was, you know.